and you know leading that ITSM program there and, and rolling out um, the, the platform that we use currently. Uh, we were an old remedy shop and we brought in ServiceNow uh, years and years and years ago. And with that being said, the one thing I want to say is that I have, I have moved on from Ohio State and, and actually now work for ServiceNow. This is not a ServiceNow plug. I'm not here to talk about ServiceNow. If you have other conversation, questions about that, that's fine. This is just purely from an ITSM. Mitch and, and, and some other members of this group um, that I know you guys have graciously kept me on uh, to be a part of this because I, I, you know, I've always been a fond fan of um, we get asked in the higher ed, you get asked to do a lot of work with little to no resources and budgets that are really kind of like not even peanuts. It's like the empty shells, not <laughs> whatever's left over from everything else. And they get, you get told to do everything with nothing. And I, I've always just kind of have that, that weird little soft spot for that. So this is cool. And I, again, Mitch, thanks again for keeping me on board and letting me still participate and, and hang out. Yeah, this this was uh, this was all Kim. So uh, appreciate <laughs> Kim from UCR uh, setting this up, and and thank you for making that uh, little uh, statement in the beginning. So uh, um, appreciate you making that clear to everyone. So thanks. Yeah. No, no problem, Mitch. And Kim, thanks again. So with that being said, this started, and I can't remember um, the gentleman's name that that sent out an email moons ago, um, but uh, you know, basically, I, it was, I think it was Rich. Rich, thank mm -hmm. you, Rich mm -hmm. Meyer. And uh, from UC Berkeley, and he said, hey, listen, I got some quick questions about industry best practices for problem or industry best practices for change and how things are going and could people share. And, and I reached out and said, hey, man, if you, anytime you want to chat, I mean, I can, I could give you the examples that, like I said, bring it in from the beginning of the platform for ServiceNow from Ohio State's perspective. However, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not here to talk about Ohio State's perspective. I'm here to talk about this, the industry. So as my job takes me around from companies all over to organizations, to, to universities, talking about those industry practices. So when we look at those, so um, what I was planning on doing is just kind of showing a real high level overview for those of you that are in the ServiceNow platform. It's very, very simple. You've probably seen these. Um, for change and problem. And then from there, you know, just talking about some real simple high level industry best practices and then opening it up to some Q and A because we only have an hour. I don't want to, I don't want to take an hour and just talk. I'd like to, you know, open it up. And, and, and the great thing is all the different players that are on here, um, everybody you know, has their, has their feedback and using this as a forum type mentality. So with that, hey, Bob. Said, yeah, this is Scott Johnson. Hey so, Scott. I'll, I'll cover any Ohio State questions. Hey, perfect, Scott. Thanks, my man. Hey, you guys, that's Scott Johnson. Scott was, uh, I was with Scott when we first rolled out uh, ServiceNow at Ohio State, so he'll be able to take that on. Um, anyway, thanks, Scott, for coming in. So I, I real, real briefly, what I want to do is I just want to uh, start by showing off, you know, that, that problem, uh, problem management process life cycle. And let me go ahead and get this started, and I'll share my screen. second here folks can everybody see my screen i see a thumbs yes. up yes, yes. yes. I, I, I see a, <laughs> i see a thumbs up so getting into the problem manager life cycle it's a very simple process we all have been familiar with it you've gotten new and then it's you assess it to see if it's truly a problem. If it's not, or look, this is a great opportunity for you to look to see if there's existing ones. Then you get into the RCA. And, and, and I know people have, you know, it's gone through Kepler Trego training and they, you know, I got my five whys. Um, and, and I'm not here to talk about which one's best. You know, how, how you as an organization want to focus on making sure that you get to that root cause, that RCA. That's, that's entirely up to you. They're all equally valuable in their own ways. And it's, it comes down to that comfort level. And once you do that, then that's where, you know, the problem manager kicks into that next piece, which is the fun piece, is that fix in progress. You know, whether it be, hey, accepting the fact that there's a known error, uh, accepting the fact that here there's just going to be a workaround and we're going to live with it, accepting the fact that we're going to open up a change and we're going to submit the change so that functionality can be readjusted, changed, whatever the case may be to fix this. Whatever the case may be, this is where that fix in progress, then it gets resolved. And then obviously we all know that, you know, there might be a fix in progress. There might also be other incidents that come out of that. Maybe whatever we did 
didn't quite uh, um, fix it based upon our RCA. And then there's that act, that aspect of, you know what, it's not resolved. We can go back to the RCA and start to do a little bit deeper dive. Um, and then obviously we can close it. So just to kind of uh, overview of getting into that process, just as what I talked about, you know, one of the, the big things that, um, you know, when you talk about an industry best practice is having up front that coordinator. Uh, somebody sent out a great message last night I was reading, and I wish I could remember the name, but I apologize if you're on here and I don't remember your name. <laughs> But that would be the fact of having that coordinator, you know, take that over. You know, a lot of the old school mentality is, is we have this problem manager and this problem manager goes through and they look at all these problems. And they're like, OK, I'll just work on this one because it's supposedly a high priority or I'll work on this one. Well, now, you know, organizations are starting to say, OK, in our apps team, we're going to have problem coordinators in our infrastructure teams. We're going to have problem coordinators. And and from there, what tends to happen is, you know, the problem comes up, that problem coordinator takes it takes it they look at it and that's where they start to assess it they put it in that state of assess they start to look at is this truly uh, a problem is there you know are there incidents attached to this is there duplicates does it have enough information for me to even move it forward and then what what happens from there is they kind of own it that's theirs now and they drive that rca uh and you get into a more of a task driven approach instead of the old school of let's call a war room and bring everybody around the table and sit around and have conversations or the emails back and forth. I can live in a mentality where I can reach out to my different groups and, and assign tasks or assign work to them to do so that we can get to the RCA so that I can understand everything that's gone on um, to, to get to that finalized, whatever it is, whether it's a known error, whether it's a workaround, whether it's a change, um, that's going to be implemented. Uh, um, so this is, you know, that mentality of that problem coordinator, and it's it's really taking off, and it's finally, you know, it's getting some traction. That task-driven approach is another piece that's becoming a, a best practice because, again, um, you know, we're trying to be. And I saw somebody with DevOps and Agile. I saw some messages about all that, and you know, and ITIL four is now out and about, and it's combining all these pieces. We're trying to be lean. We have to be lean. And we have to be agile. We have to work in a more uh, efficient way. And so if I can own this and I can send it to Carrie, I, Carrie, I'm going to borrow you just because I looked to the right and I saw you. Uh, <laughs> if I say to Carrie and she works in such and such group, I'm going to assign this task to you, please. And I can fill in the information. Please do your due, due, due diligence and from the information back that will help me fill out my RCA. And so we get into that root cause analysis. Um, the great thing is, is also one thing that, is always a um, afterthought is that known error, that known error, not just a known error, but that known error article where we can utilize it for our knowledge management. Um, for those of you that are real big knowledge management people, this, you know, we've always heard about the known error database. Everybody's like, but you can never find anybody that actually has one. Um, and now it's a big thing where, you know, right, right along with identifying your RCA and recognizing that, oh, you know what, this is just something we're gonna have to live with. We don't have the resources, whether it be economical people, to uh, fix this problem. But this is our workaround, so we can create that known error, and we have that article, and it's part of our knowledge base, and we can utilize that workaround notes. And, and so we start to become strategic in our reuse of information, which is what knowledge is all about. Um, and so that's you know, a real high level for problem management. You can see the rest of it, you know, create tasks, the fix implementation, apply the fix, document it, and conduct but problem is is it's starting to grow more and more and more and more organizations i'm starting to see really take on problem management problem management used to be like knowledge management. knowledge management was the one that was always funny yeah we like knowledge management we have knowledge management but there's no governance around it and it kind of dies on the vine with bad documentation and outdated well problem was always the bastard stepchild many organizations lived off of <laughs> this guy's over here cutting uh, a lot of organizations lived off of, well, if it's not a P1, then don't worry about problem management or a major incident. Don't worry about problem management. But I'm starting to now see, again, that string last night, somebody mentioned there that they're starting to investigate and, and, and really think about, okay, let's, let's start to look at trends. Yes, we're still in a reactive state, but let's start to look at trends and start creating problem records and trying to truly, based upon the definition, reduce the number of reoccurring incidents. Um, that are out there. And so that, you know, to me, that's the great place to be for all of us that are sitting here and you're having this conversation and we're having this and you're thinking about it is beyond 
just having problems off of MIMS uh, or major incident management or, or off of P1s or however you identify that. Let's go one step further and say, you know what, why is it that on every Monday and Friday we have a massive uptick in these incidents? Or better yet, and, and Scott, thanks for being on here. Scott can attest to this when, you know, when, I, when I was at Ohio State. At the beginning of every quarter and then semester, there was a certain platform that just got smoked. And there were massive amounts of incidents that would happen at the beginning, inevitably, two weeks before it start and two weeks after. Well, why aren't we creating a problem record in, in investigating, getting that, work, that root cause to understand why is this system not working correctly for our students? So that in the first two weeks before, two weeks after, why, the value to them is like, this thing sucks. So taking that opportunity to look at the massive amount of incidents that come in, creating our problems, getting the RCA, and then getting a fix. Oh, maybe it could be you know, a capacity issue. Maybe when it was being planned and built in, you know, it wasn't planned for the capacity or the growth of the usage. And maybe now's the time to start thinking about that. So that's a great place. If you're not there yet, I, I challenge you to take a look at your, from a problem management aspect to say, how can, how can we grow? Uh, how can we take it? So if you're in problem and you're like, listen, we only do problem off of major incident, which I totally understand. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but mature the process, mature for your organization and start to look at your problem children. And I say that not as in like this ticket or this ticket, your problem children as in things that aren't working correctly when they should and how they should and start to start to do the RCA on that. And obviously the why I say that is the stereotypical thing that you see a lot of, and, and you guys probably, I don't want to speak for everybody, but in IT is, well, if nobody brings it to my attention, it doesn't really, just the lights are blinking, it's working, so I'm good to go. Um, and I, the unfortunate part is the IT, the deeper, deeper levels of IT don't under, they don't get to see what our users are seeing and experiencing. They say, well, the blinky light's blinking and I can hear the fan running. We're good to go. Yeah, but nobody can get to it. Uh, or I got a 30 minute wait, or I got to refresh this browser every 10 minutes to, to link to another. So you, you can kind of see where I'm going with this from, from a problem management process overview, kind of what we were talking about and how the, some of the things that are changing is again, this problem coordinator mentality, getting into a task driven approach of getting the technical support brought on board and, and driving that from like a, not quite like a project management mentality, but that problem coordinator driving this um, to, to uh, that RCA, and of course that fix. Um, that's where the, the, you know, getting into the industry and what's happening, what I see happening, you know, being out there and getting to play with other modules and other platforms and, and being with customers, um, whether they be higher ed and or outside higher ed companies. It's, it, problem is starting to take, it's finally, it's digging in <laughs> and, and it's taking root and, and it's starting to grow a lot more. So what I want to do is I'll stop a problem and then I'm going to kick over to change um, real quick and, and then I'll go over change real quick and then we'll just open it up to Q&A if that's cool with everybody. Let me bring up change here. Hey, Bob. Um, yeah. There was a question in the chat. I thought it was a really good one. Can I bring it to your attention? Oh. Yeah, no, let's, okay, let's do this. Let's, let's just spend the next 15 minutes chatting and then we'll go into change. Let's do that. Go for it. All right, just uh, someone asked here um, about um, causes of change isn't always technical. It could be process or people or maybe a partner. Uh, is there a room in the swim lane to identify that? I mean, there is. And obviously when you get into the, the cause, um, that's where you get it more towards the, uh, that root cause analysis phase where you start to look at, okay, what is it? Well, that, that's, that's like getting into state changes and, and, and understanding uh, what it is. So yes, so when you get into that problem, and let me bring that, well, I've already closed it out. But when you get into that RCA, it's 100% where you're gonna bring that into play. And before you close it out anyway, even after it's been fixed, you're gonna document that and, and recognize that. And if you have contractual aspects, this is where, um, you know, if you have contractual as, as, SLAs, um, or whatever you want to call them in place. Um, this is where that vendor management aspect is going to come into play heavily because we, uh, you have problems. And I mean, so let me give you a great example. Uh, 
uh, when I'm working at Ohio State, a higher ed institution, um, we used uh, Microsoft for their free email for students. And um, it was, it was a great, it's a great service, it's free. Let me ask, does everybody understand the concept of you get what you pay for? <laughs> it was free. And why I bring that up is when there was incidents and we had to bring it up to Microsoft, these things sat around for moons. These tickets that, that needed support set, would sit around. Well, you know, as you'd have conversations with, with Microsoft saying, hey, listen, guys, you, we, we've sent you 125 in the last 30 days. What's going on with them? Well, you know, we're getting to them when we get to them. It was a free service. That helps me understand the level of service that I'm going to get. So there was no contract. That should help me as, as an organization drive to a better provider at that point in time and getting into a contract that we can hold them accountable. So when we do get into the root cause now, so we get into problem records because we do see a trend with the level of service that they're providing, um, I can closely tie that with that, that contract that's in place or that, or that agreement or that SOW, whatever you want to call that in place. So hopefully that helps out. All right, good, yeah. Um, another question here about your experience when you're talking to uh, cu customers um, is the role of the project, or, sorry, pro problem coordinator within the service management organization or is it distributed among the various uh, teams and assigned to a subject matter expert? It's distributed. Um, and, and why it's distributed is, so you do have a problem manager role. Um, so let me use the example of, so thanks Mitch for asking that question. So Mitch would be my overall process owner and problem manager. He might have a couple problem managers that might work from an ITSM service management role. And they look at the overall process and the overall volume of everything that's going on. But at the end of the day, these problem coordinators sit in areas. And um, like I said a little bit when I first started that problem coordinator, so applications, let's use our applications as a great example. You're gonna have problem coordinators that that's, that's gonna be part of their role is to, to, to manage these problems that are associated with it these applications. Um, they understand the problem management process. They live the problem management process. They're in lockstep with the problem manager and also the problem process owner to understand how this works. But at the end of the day, when they're getting to the RCA, when they're working this problem record, they live and breathe applications. They know who to bring to the table. Whereas if you bring in somebody that's an infrastructure guy or a network person, the network guy's gonna be like, I don't, I don't know anything about it hey, it's never the network problem. It's always something else. So we're good. They're not going to, they can't, they can't understand. So it definitely lives within that. Uh, let's, I don't, I hate to say tower, but um, let's, let's call it that. Great question. Uh, are you okay with one more before we move on? Yeah, to yeah, yeah, no, we're good. Keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, you had mentioned kind of just some passing problem manager and problem owner, but really uh, aren't they looking at different responsibilities, maybe one more in the governance area and one more of kind of like a practitioner, you know, working with the, with the process day in and day out? Correct, correct. So you obviously you're, look at your process owner as the overall owner of it. They're trying to make sure that the process itself is maturing. They're, trying, they're trying to make sure that, as Mitch just mentioned, thanks, or whoever, Dave, thank you, I see that. The, from a governance standpoint, that problem is working uh, the way it should be working with change, with incident, and making sure that from an organizational aspect that you have problem management. The problem manager gets down into a little bit more of the weeds. They get, it, they get, they get their fingers a little more dirty with the actual. So the problem manager should be looking at the volume. Okay, I, why do I have, wh why aren't any of these being worked? Okay, now I can reach out to the problem coordinator. Uh, what's going on in what's going on in our infrastructure? Oh, I'm recognizing trends. They they should be. Oh, I'm recognizing trends. Maybe I should go ahead and help out and create a problem record for them at this point in time, uh, and then get to get together with the infrastructure problem coordinators and say, Hey, listen, I opened this up because I've been watching the queue from the the service desk and the incident management side of things and noticing that we're seeing a massive uptick. Blah 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 blah. So we get into a pro, uh, you know trying to be as proactive as possible. So again. There is, a, there is a big difference. That process owner sits above, <laughs> for lack of a term. Now, these are roles. I don't know your organization. Some of you come from small universities. Some of you from big universities. Some of them you don't have the bandwidth or people bandwidth. These are roles. You take off one hat, you put on another hat. So understanding what that is is, is a big thing. And it's actually, Marianne, thank you. Those roles may be one person. I just, I just saw that. So. Uh, Marianne, awesome. Any other questions when it comes to problem? Mm -hmm. 
All right. So what I'll do is now that it's about 1120, because change is always a fun one. Sorry, Kim. Kim had one that she wanted oh, to. Oh, uh, Kim, yeah. go for it. Uh, I'll just read it if, if that's okay. So for RCA process, how do you determine the best methodology to use? Kim, I, I would love to say that one is better than the other. Um, I, I mean, whether it be fishbone, whether it be the five whys, I, I don't, I don't, I don't say one is better than the other. It's what's your appetite? How, how do you want to get to what, what seems to work for you? Um, I mean, I, if there's, I don't know how many people are on here, but if I were to ask everybody to, to type in what they want um, or what they're doing, I, I bet it's going to be all over the board. On, on what they're doing. Some are, you know, there's going to be a large chunk that's going to be with the five whys. There's going to be another chunk that's with. So I, I wouldn't, I wish I could tell you how to determine the best methodology. I think it's going to be one of those, if you're just starting with problem management, pick one, roll with it, see how it works. And if it doesn't, mature the process by choosing another. Um, and, but getting the training uh, is going to be the big thing of understanding, you know, how to get to the root cause. So I wish I could give you a definitive answer and if anybody else wants to jump in and say hey listen we use such and such and it works like gangbusters for us that'd be um that'd be awesome i think culture would play a lot into that as well depending on the culture of your institution you know they may lean more towards the other so it's really almost like a fit for you sort of a, a scenario thanks scott anybody, anybody else have, have an idea or, or tell me what you're using Hey, Dave, I, I just saw your question. <laughs> I, I will say this is the same thing I tell everybody. The best way to get problem embedded is, is taking more as a token process and contrast to instant change. We're struggling to get the teams across it as they feel they're always doing it. Uh, a lot of people look at problem as, oh, this is just red tape that I got to go through. Um, I, first of all, if you don't have buy-in from the top, it's just not going to get embedded. I'm sorry. I mean, nothing burns at the bottom. Um, you can have the best intentions to roll out problem management and to uh, get it going and dig it in deep and you start to show off the wonderful things of what it can do for your organization by creating these known errors that exist with these workarounds. You can do it all, but if you don't have upper, upper levels uh, buying into it and helping you push, it's just going to fade. And, and for an organization, and, and I love when teams say, well, we're already doing it. Are you really? Why do I keep having the same incidents over and over again? Um, you know, that's, it's just, you know, there's so many pieces and layers to this. In any process, and anybody, I see Todd's on here and Mitch and, and it's Scott and Lisa, you could say that about any process. Well, we're already doing it. Everything you're doing today, you're doing release management today in your organization. It's just not defined. Well, why do we need to define it? Well, so you can measure it, so you can mature it, so you can grow it, so you can show true value from it. These are all you know, questions that need to be asked and they're hard questions for people to answer. And um, so in order for that to grow, it has to, it has to burn from the top and, and, and come from that aspect. Because even to build it out, you're still going to need buy-in because of the resources that it's going to take just to get it built out. Even if you're using an out-of-the-box mentality for your platform, um, you're still going to need to name those roles that we've been talking about. You're still going to have to have these people, these, these uh, users be involved and engaged enough to start to do it uh, versus I uh, will get around to it. So, um, so that, that would probably be my, my best answer for, for that, um, Dave. Um, oh gosh, Marianne. <laughs> Marianne just posted a, a comment that says, I will, Marianne, can I say it? I think everybody can read it. Um, I will yes, say and it, it surprised <laughs> the hell out of me how many people said, Oh, but I didn't want to get so and so in trouble, or gee, I don't want, I don't want all that attention with my service. And oh, do we have to document that? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, crazy. Marianne, I love it because, you know, organized. <laughs> It's a pride thing. Nobody wants to be uh, shown that what, they, what they've been working so hard to keep up and running is a piece of junk. Let's be honest. Yep. And when you tell them, hey, listen, that outdated thing that sounds like a, you know, a, a semi-truck motor that runs down in the bottom of a basement, 
that thing's not doing anything. So, uh, and Laura, thank you. You've got to frame it as a continuous improvement and removing technical debt. I love those comments. But even then, I, I will have to say the caveat, I'll play devil's advocate, is it's a pride issue. You got a guy who, you know, when, when wireless was, you know, first coming out and everybody was still wired in. I, actually, let me back up. I'll go one step further. When I first started at OSU, uh, Scott probably remembers this fun. Uh, we still had dial-up internet where we would install um, free internet. Like when I say install, we would go to uh, a professor emeritus and, and install <laughs> with a disc dial-in internet. And it was costing the university about $65,000 a year to have this thing running. It was free to them, not free to the university. And you talk about that technical debt and that continuous improvement. This, I mean, who uses dial-up? I mean, I use DSL and I live out in the middle of nowhere, but at the end of the day, $65,000 for these users to use dial up and all, by the way, a resource to leave the university and go to your house to install this so that you can use your dial up modem to get free internet because you didn't want to bring in Cox or whatever the case may be. Um, that, that to me was again, in the pro there was a lot of problems with it, but that technical debt. Thank you very much, Laura. That was absolutely, uh, fantastic that you said that uh and christine <laughs> been there done that love it i i too this is todd jensen um uh, university of nebraska i too think that some of this challenge with blame game and all these things is a cultural thing right i mean it's kind of in the dna of a lot of our organizations and so what i kind of think about and again it's a long process but how do you change some of the basic norms can you publish positive things that are happening with services that, oh, there haven't been any outages for these things and kind of focus on that positive outcome. And then, um, you know, in the bowels of, of, of our problem process and things, how do we improve it to get those services that are having those challenges on that list that's public, publicized in a way that's positive. And so, and there is that whole thing. I love your story, Bob, about the, um, the service that you're talking about, the, the dial-up concept. I saw a note from Chaz Grundy from uh, Notre Dame where they were looking at Andrew file system. Um, if any of you know what that is, um, I didn't know when he was talking about it, but it basically was like a 30 year process of trying to get rid of it. Um, uh, well, maybe not that long, but the service was that old and they needed to get rid of it. So uh, great to have see everyone here. I really appreciate the conversation. And I'll let you get back to um, the wonderful conversation that you've been having. No, well, this is great. Thank, thanks, Todd. Nice seeing you again. Yeah, good see you as well. Uh, and, and so I'll take, we'll, we'll go for two more minutes and then we'll switch gears and go, go right into change. Um, and Gino, thanks for bringing that up. Is Gino put in a note here that says they've chosen to view problems as process improvement opportunities. So they take the Lean Six Sigma approach and this extends problem to include virtually anything that will improve a service. And that's a, that's a great way of looking at it from a, just even a process and not necessarily a technological aspect. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, but buy-in from the top is critical. This, this approach would not work if it wasn't, or if it didn't have buy-in all the way up and down the, uh, the org. I, you know, thanks for your input. And that's awesome because if you guys can't get buy-in, all you're doing is building a resume bullet for yourself. I mean, really at the end of the day, there's no, it's, it, it will die on the vine. I hate to say it. I, I have a friend of mine who works, who I still speak with today on a probably a monthly basis at a large university um, that I won't name. And he struggles daily on some of the processes that he owns. And um, he was just told, hey, stand these up and let's get to using them without any buy-in, without any, um, any, any um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any growth opportunity without any help they're just dying, but he's being held accountable for this. So, uh, and, and I could tell you, <laughs> Scott, thanks. Yes. Um, I, I won't, you know, leadership is a big, big, I, I use the term leadership very, very candidly. There's a difference between management and leadership in my book. Leadership is it, management is going to be, I lead by the book. You do, as I say, not, you know, not as I do, no, I'm just going to say, it. but leadership is the one I'm going to follow. this. I'm going to follow this person, this person, what they're doing. And, when I started, I will say this, when I started at OSU, there was a big push, the leader that we had in place, that individual, individual was holding people's feet to the fire. 
And somebody mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about how do we get this to grow, whatever the case may be. And I can remember sitting in a meeting and listening to somebody say, oh, what was me? Complain, complain. And this CIO that I had at the time, they looked at that person and said, you're not a victim. Stop being a victim. Take responsibility for the services that you own. And really, to me, that was like a moment in my career where I kind of giggled at first when you heard it. But as I sit back and look at it, in IT, that's, that's in anything we do, that's really what needs to happen. Take ownership. You own it. You've been classified. You're getting paid to be the owner of this service, quote unquote service. Make it better. So, um, and then, you know, you switch gears and then you get uh, another leader or another manager and it's not quite the leader where they're kind of like, oh, we don't really care about service management anymore. That's a, that's red tape. Let's just get it done. And, and I'm sure all of you have heard that great comment of, just get it done. It's basic blocking and tackling, folks. That's the way you guys have been doing it for years. Yeah, okay, but there's no definition. There's no measurements. How do you know you're doing good versus bad? So, uh, um, and Mike, Michael Morris, fantastic. The blameless culture has to come from from the top. I mean, it just, yeah. No, I was quoting Mitch, but yeah, oh. that's, uh, I completely <laughs> agree with that statement. That that sums it all up very nicely. Um, so anyway, let, let me, let's, let's switch gears real quick and cause change is always a fun one, um, that, uh, I, I love change. I will tell you guys, um, uh, real, really, uh, really funny story. As I go out and meet with a lot of customers, change management is the absolute, <laughs> And why I bring that up is because we all understand and know that during change management, there's, there's three basic tenets of change management. You've got your normal change, new, assess, authorize, scheduled, implement, review, and so forth. And then you get into, you know, your emergency where it goes, you know, from a new automatically authorized. We don't need to assess because a lot of times your emergency is coming from your P1, your major incidents, and that major incident manager has been given the carte blanche to say, yes, let's get this emergency change submitted and get it authorized. And then the standard is the pre-approved, uh, uh, pre-approved, very common. Um, you know, it's, it's really a very simple way of doing things. It uh, you know, happens all the time. And so uh, when, when we get into all of these different types of changes, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies that I see are like, well, we have more than this. What about latent changes? And I'm like, well, okay, so you put in a change after the fact and create an emergency change at that point because you don't need to take it through the asset. Well, I know I need a latent change. Okay, why? You know, we get into that kind of fun. Or standard change. I love when people create standard changes or they want to create standard changes and they put approvals within a standard change, which defeats the whole purpose of a standard change. They just want to make sure that it's expedited, that mentality. So this becomes our expedited change. Um, I, you know, I'm very, 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 very hard on uh, organizations when they say, well, I need all of these. No, you don't need all of these. You need to look at things a little differently from the way you've always been doing it and say, you know what? Standard change, pre-approved, very common. Let's live with it. And then you create your templates and so forth. Normal change, very simple. This takes care of everything. And then we prioritize based upon, you know, risk analysis and, and you know, going through all of that on whether it's a low, medium, or high and so forth. Uh, and then emergency is how, how do you, how does it go? How, how do we put in our emergency changes? And if you're putting in changes after the fact, first of all, let me say this, if you're putting in changes after the fact, there, had, there has to be a great reason. And that's why I always lean on create it as emergency. Emergency changes aren't bad. But don't, don't start creating all these different and, and start adding to the laundry list of types of changes um, because what that does is that becomes very confusing on the submitters um, and, and so forth. So getting into uh, you know, these types of changes, um, you, know, the, you know, that normal new SAS authorized, you know, I, I'm real, real big. The great thing is how many of you, and, and you don't have to tell me, but I just want you to think about this, have changes that have layers and layers and layers of approvals. Um, and, and, and I, I don't, I mean, I, like I said, I don't, I don't need to know the answer, but the layers and layers of approvals. When you start to talk about an industry press practice, once you get past three and three is a lot, once you get past three, it's, it becomes bad. Not, not like, Oh, maybe we should change this. It becomes bad. 
And one thing that I challenge any change manager or change process owner is have the hard conversations of, Bob, why do you need this approval? Well, I just need to know that it's happening. What? That, why do you need an approval for this? Um, why can't you be on a watch list of some sort or get, in, get a notification? Because then you start to get into the rubber stamp mentality. I will give you guys an example. I was in an organization and I, as I go through and I look at the change process and I go through and look at their platform bill and all that kind of stuff, I found one change. This was one change for one service that had 80, I'm not kidding you, 81 approvals. I don't know about you, but how is that even remotely valuable? And anybody on here that's a change manager, you've probably heard, why do I got to submit a change? It's just red tape. I know I can just go back behind the scenes and just do it and get it done. And then you as a change manager, you're like, listen, man, the reason why you document it is because inevitably what you're going to do is going to break something down the line, which is going to create incidents. And then we got to trace it back. Oh, find out that there's this change. And so we can document it. it you know, it, I, 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 emphasize, I can't emphasize enough that change managers are very valuable. And I totally get that people have this mentality. It's a red tape but it's a red tape because we put in a lot of layers to change management that make it convoluted and confusing for our submitters, our approvers, and our, our, our builders, uh, uh, so to speak, to, to get what they need to do to get it done. So, you know, getting into this, you know, it's taking a new change and it gets submitted. And, and once it sits in that new, and it can sit in new for as long as you want, but once you submit it, that's where that, that, that assessment, somebody needs to take a look at this and say, hey, is there enough here for me to move it forward? And yes, we could go through and talk about, oh, these fields are mandatory and uh, this is how you fill out a correct change record and all that good stuff. But is, this, is, this, is there enough for me to move this forward to that next level of approval? And, and, and now you go down the layer, that next layer is, and I'll call it the technical peer approver, but this could be the owner of the CI. This could be a technical group that looks over this. There's no right or wrong. It just needs somebody to look at it from a technical aspect um, to say, hey, um, this, there is enough. We agree with this. Um, we can begin to move. And you can, the big thing is, is I, I, and I put in here, you know, the authorized state, you know, when it's a low risk, you've done your risk analysis um, and however, however you tend to do that and set your priority. If it's low, let's get it moved. If it's moderate to high, now we can get into the cap. And we start to get into the scheduling and we start to get into the, the real, you know, the, the fun meetings that everybody just kind of sits quietly and doesn't pay attention to. Um, and then from there, we can reject and approve and we can look at our, you know, forward schedule of change and start to say, hey, you know what, this, this cannot happen at this point in time because we've got three others that are happening that could be affected by this. Schedule it, implement this beast, um, and, and then review what happened, what, what, what made it successful. And, and I want to talk briefly about the review aspect whether the change has been successful or unsuccessful. You know, I, I hear a lot of, well, it's successful with issues. I love this one. Well, I don't, I don't, if it has issues, to me, it's not successful. To your organization and, and, your, and your appetite, maybe you are saying that's successful. And I always have to tell people, even if it is unsuccessful, that's not a negative. Don't look at it as a negative. Yes. That's a growth yes. opportunity. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I heard somebody. Oh, maybe not. Um, so if it's not successful, if it's unsuccessful, you know, do what you need to do to get it back to successful, but use that as a growth and use it as an opportunity to go back and look at the process and look at the information in the process and figure out what, where were the gaps? Why wasn't it successful? Um, and, and, um, and then, you know, once you've done your review and, and make sure that when you do your PIRs, your post implementation reviews, and whether you have a release manager or just change manager, that you are very thorough. I, I can't emphasize enough the value. Of, of having a good PIR with lots of valuable information. Um, because this is, again, this is going to be a piece that you can use from a knowledge aspect, a strategic reuse. All of us, me, all of you, have great information between your ears. And you use that from a knowledge aspect to provide value on everything you do. But think about the rest of the organization that's not as smart as you. <laughs> and what they have and how you can better this and make this, you know, increase the, 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 the value of the change management process from a normal aspect. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the flow states, um, but I wanted to stop right there because I know we only have about 20 minutes and I want to just open this up for more discussion because change is such, it, change is like something we should have taken like two hours to talk about. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, here we go. Um, so, what, so this is my, can I ask a question real quick, if you don't mind? Um, yeah. you, you touched on something completed with issues or uh, successful with issues or, or however you want to say it. Yep. So I, I wanted to know if anybody was was kind of using the method that we are. So what we do uh, is successful with issues. Uh, we have an implemented state and a closed state. Uh, we use service now. Um, we use the with issues, meaning that uh, you were successful. You met your end goal, uh, but it took longer than you asked for, or it took more resources than you documented. So we can kind of circle back, run a PIR, uh, on that change and find out, you know, okay, where did we miss? Uh, we were successful. We got whatever it is implemented. We wanted implemented, but where did we miss on time uh, or resources? And it's kind of a learning opportunity. So that's what we use it for. Thanks. That's awesome. Hey, Bob. Who is that? Go for it. Whomever. Uh, this is Chris Agnelli from NYU. Hey, Chris. Uh, Thanks, thanks to everybody for having this session. I really appreciate it. Um, I work with Simon Pride, who many of you probably know from this group. And so he handles the problem side of things and I handle the change. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have two questions that we could probably spend four hours on each discussing. Um, but just quickly, you know, what we're struggling with right now is we have about a four year old, pretty mature process for change in service now. We're doing a massive data center sort of migration to the cloud and to SaaS. Um, and so the first part is, you know, how do we see change management working in the new order of things where everything's in the cloud or SaaS provided, you know? Uh, and, you know, for the stuff that we are still working on, we're, we're trying to do more agile and DevOps. And I saw those messages that were going around last night. And so we're not quite at the state of CI, CD into production, but we're doing everything up to that point, you know, in some of the development teams. So what's the role of change management? You know, I'm trying to get them to think about automating changes within those tools so that, you know, we can just at least record the changes that they're making. Um, but uh, really the, the first question is, what I'm more interested in, you know, like how do we see change working in the in the cloud and SaaS world? Are we still doing change management, and what does it look like? I mean, from from my standpoint, yes, you're, we we should still be doing change management, just purely from an informational aspect. Yes, um, and, and um, <laughs> I mean, and I understand, you know, we start to outsource. Here's the thing. You have your process, your change management process. Um, if you if you are working with an entity and negotiating and whatnot, you know it's very very important to understand what their change management process is, so that you guys can be aware of what's happening. Um, I can tell you from experience, organizations, the 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 parent organization would have a change management process and say, yeah, this is how we do it, this is how we measure it, this is how we're building it, this is how we expect it to be done, and then they get in partnership because they've outsourced fill in the blank and they get into partnership and this other group has their own way of doing change management, which is fine. I, and I don't, I don't discourage that, but what I, what I do challenge is when you, and this isn't for the change management people, this is much larger. This is where I, I think Mitch talked about governance earlier and on in this meeting. This is where a governance mentality comes into play of, okay, let's, let's look at how they do change management and say, you know, is this going to provide the information that we need? And then, then you get into the conversations on whether you build integrations with your platforms and so forth. But making sure that they are doing their due diligence on their side because that's the service that they provide to you. Um, so that well, would be I think even, even beyond governance, it, it sort of gets into vendor management. You know, like, mm -hmm. are, are we partnering with the right organizations, um, you know, if they're not doing change management on their side? And I'll give you an example that we struggled with. So we recently had a big Zoom update and you know it, it changed a pretty critical functionality about users needing to authenticate by default before they can join a meeting and by default turning on waiting rooms. 
So, you know, it was, it was, you know, big change management from the non-technical perspective. And my first gut reaction was this needs to go to the cab. And then Simon and I had conversations and it's like, they're doing this on July 19th. It's happening. We have no control over it. Uh, the cab is not a vehicle for communicating changes, right? Um, generally. And so what is the cab going to do? Everybody knows about this change. You know, it's been communicated out. What exactly is the role of the cab in this if we have no say in, in it happening? You know, and so as we get more and more of this type of change, that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. So do you have currently, do you have a, a representation on their cab? You know, th this, and this is part of that relationship, again, going into that process, is there needs to be, you know, just like, just like you want the infrastructure representation and the application representation on your internal cab, they have to have, in order, that, that relationship between you and that vendor, you have to have representation on their cab to say, time out. You cannot be doing this change because this is going to affect fill in the blank uh, downstream. Um, so I, I, would, I would, you mentioned the vendor management, which is a massive piece of this. Um, because of the, the act. and that goes not just for change, that goes for any of the processes and any of the SOPs that you have in place today on how to, because there's nothing more confusing on telling this group they can do it this way and that group they can do it this way and that group they can do it that way and so forth, making sure that it's standard because you know what, Janet at, at the University of Michigan has, has built out her process and this process is what they're measuring everybody against. You know, do, that should be part of that. that. That unfortunately should be part of that vendor management aspect also of them understanding what you do and how you're doing and making sure that they're somewhat in lockstep. Because if, we, if you say, and Chris, if you say, hey, listen, all of our changes that are high, high risk, we want it to go to a cap. No, no, no question about it, they have to go to a cap. Or medium to high, they go to a cap. But at the end of the day, if they're like, no, 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 we don't, the only thing that goes to the cab is just high. We don't, we don't have medium. Okay, so there's a disconnect between your group and their group. Um, how do you how do you break down that barrier? How do you negotiate? And say, listen, for our health and safety, we need this. This is Gino Banana from UC San Diego. Uh, I think one of the critical components here is whether you have a contract with these individuals, with this uh, organization, or if you're just subscribing to a service. Uh, you have no leverage if you're just subscribing to a service. They they you get what they give you. Uh, you don't have a contract with them. If you have a contract with them, you can build into the contract something that says you will adhere to some change management uh, principles and you need to notify us about this. Zoom is a great example. It's a service. They provide the service and you pay for it in a subscription way. So you don't really have much leverage there. You're not on their board. You have no seat at the table. Uh, you're just buying it. But with uh, you know something like AWS, you have the you can negotiate, and it's something that you could build in. That says if you're going to do maintenance, you need to let us know in advance so that we can take it to the cab and advise the cab. And the cab may not be the vehicle for notification, but they are a vehicle, they receive uh, and they become aware so they can communicate to their groups. And so in, instead of being the notifier, they're getting notified. And that's, that's got a lot of value. Hi, this is uh, Lou Sanchez from the California State University System. Uh, Chris, we had a very similar situation with Zoom and they dictated to us about that vulnerability we were on a everybody was in a back version of zoom and in our cab we have representation in our support center and they're in charge of issuing bulletins so when we deem something that needs to get to all our 23 schools or to the chancellor's office uh, they handle the bulletin process that's not one size fits all but the manager of our support center is part of our cab and they control the notification process i don't know if that helps or uh, but things come up as you know, they're gonna impact either system-wide for us or just the chancellor's office. So that's how, because we'll, uh, as Gina was saying, uh, some shops and some organizations do a better job, like ServiceNow, if they're doing a major change, they, they're really good about notifying their customers ahead of time, but other, other vendors don't do it as well. So you have to kind of uh, do the organized chaos thing once in a while, I guess. Yeah. Thanks everybody.
Hey, hey Actually, Lou. Um, can, can, can I add oh, two cents in there? Uh, this is Dave from uh, Auckland University in New Zealand. Um, we've, we've been running a change process for many, many years, and it all comes down to, uh, from my perspective, the communication aspect. You know, um, I don't think the need to go to CAB is, is, is as strong as it used to be, you know, and um, I hear through the conversation, oh, things need to go to CAB, you know, needs to have the right representation, needs to be discussed. Um, I'm sort of moving, trying to move away from that model and, and put the ownership back down to our service owners and our product owners to say, hey, you own the service, you own the relationship. You know, if your vendor is doing a change to your service, it's your responsibility to make sure that that change will go through. If something happens and something breaks, we will then ask the question, okay, where is the, the, the breakage in that relationship? Because it, 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 it sort of starts wasting time when we say, okay, we're going to start to slow you down by saying we have to put controls and checks and balances in place. And what we're trying to do in the agile world now is move away from that control. And we want to enable people to do what they want when they want with as minimal contact with change control as possible. And there was another point someone made earlier on about um, automation. You know, my rule is if you can automate it and if you can prove that your change is consistent and it's documented and it goes through 99% of the time without impact, then I don't really mind, you know, automate your change creation, automate the approval. Cause all we want to do is audit the record to say that, Hey, we did this work. You know, so I'm, we, we, we you, need Dave. to start changing our mindsets, I think. But Dave, I'm, I'm with you, but how do you, in the first case, first point, how do you handle, so they're, they're communic the service owner is communicating to their community, but one of the major functions of our cab is to make sure that there's cross organizational awareness to make sure that we're not colliding with other changes or colliding with key business events. So, and, and that service owner whose service is being changed, they're not privy to that bigger picture of what's happening across the organization necessarily without at least that touch point from the cab right now. And I'm with you about getting rid of it, but how do we do it and not have those collisions? Hey, Chris, let me, yeah. let me, I'm going to go one step further. And Dave brought up an awesome, awesome point. And that is a sticking point for a lot of, is you mentioned a service owner and do they understand what it means to be a true service owner and represent that service going forward? Because we can sit here and talk about the term service owner, but I don't want to speak for anybody on here, but if I were to, but if I were to ask the question, a lot of people are going to have a different answer. Totally. And, and, yep. and Dave, I agree. I, I love it, Dave. That, that if you can automate it, automate it, get it off your plate and let's do this. But there are too many instances where an organization just says, Hey, uh, you know, sorry, Lisa, I'm going to use you. Lisa, you're my service owner. And you're like, cool, great. Just because you're technical and you, and you work in that area, but you don't have any idea what it means to represent that, that service across the organization and across the business and across the arms of the university, especially, and I don't know what universities you are from, but if Jan is from Michigan and Scott's from Ohio State, those are massive universities. Whereas I know, uh, Lou, you're from, you know, you're in the UC system and that's massive. And uh, somebody else was from UCSD or, or, you know, UC San Diego. So, I mean, this, there's massive universities and you have to think about the 13th largest city in Ohio with 31 individual companies and this change is going to affect them. Th that service owner doesn't grasp that. If they don't understand what being a service owner truly means, they're, it, they'll just screw people. Actually, Bob, uh, I'm at Cal State University. Oh, sorry, Lou. No, no. <laughs> Nothing against UC. I love the UCs. My... <laughs> My nephew's no, going to UCLA. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. No, I, but I, the challenge we have is we have 23 schools throughout the system, throughout California. And you can imagine the communication uh, challenge of if, if something is being implemented and it's going to be impacting system, what we say system-wide. So it's a, it's a big thing because every campus has their own methodology, you know, of doing things. So, it, but we get through it. So I, and this is this has been a great conversation, everybody. I really enjoyed this uh, meeting. I, I wish I could, you guys. If you have not been watching the group chat, it's fantastic. A lot of information, uh, Dave. I loved what you said, man. That was fantastic. I wish I could, you know, like go through and we could talk about it. But unfortunately, we have five more minutes. So. Um, yeah, Bob, I was just going to make a quick comment. Um, I think there are a lot of good spin-off uh, topics that we could pursue. Um, so I think I'm going to get together with Todd and figure out what our next steps um, are, whether that's sending out a quick uh, poll on what would be the next, 
next topic of interest okay. and gather some speakers on it. I, we could go on about change. We could go on about service owner. I think that's a great one. A lot of people are struggling with that as they're looking at their catalog and, and improving that. Um, I want to make a quick comment. There's been a lot of great discussion on, on change management. I would encourage you, if any, and I don't work for Axelos, but I just want to make a plug. If any of you have looked at the ITIL4 literature, lots of lots of changes, no pun intended, to change management. So now in change enablement, look at that practice guide, look at the release, um, release practice guide, they separated from a release and deployment, uh, both good guidance around agile and DevOps and um, lowering the risk of changes. Um, so I appreciate your, 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 your doing this, uh, Bob. So I just want to let everyone know that we want to, we are going to take this back and figure out what we're going to do, um, uh, you know, for all for this group uh, coming up and what topics we want to explore. So uh, if I could just make a comment real quick, um, Matt Howe from University of, University of Florida. Um, one I want to say, Laura said something very, very useful. I think when we talk about change, even if you can't uh, control a change, if you can't deny a change, there is value in change being recorded and change being communicated via change calendars to make sure other changes you can control don't conflict with that. Um, but I think, you know, one topic that's very interesting that's been brought up here is how do we, how does the reliance on hosted solutions, specifically Office 365, Google Apps, these different pieces play into an idle world that we're used to in higher education. When you think of Office 365 suddenly rolling out a new application without much warning, there's not a great opportunity to go ahead and roll that out through our normal process that we're used to because it just suddenly shows up when it comes to changes that we can't uh, deny. You know, that this great conversation we're having now, when we think about uh, configuration management and, and servers and your CMDB, you know, is it, does it make sense that we are uh, documenting uh, servers as they're brought up and brought down, whereas some of these services that we rely on and we utilize are using AWS in the background that are automatically rolling these things up and down at a moment's notice without us, you know, knowing what's going on there. So, you know, we've had conversations here about are we forcing ourselves to document things internally that are basically the exact same things our other providers are, are doing without documenting? And so is there a disconnect there? So I think this whole piece about how does the reliance on these hosted solutions change some of our natural processes that we've been doing for a decade in, in idle um, is really interesting to me. Oh, Bob, I just want to point people's direction to the chat. There's a link to take a survey. Uh, thanks, Todd, for putting that in there. So as uh, Kim mentioned, I don't, sorry, I didn't mean to take ownership of the moderating, but if I can help out, always glad to. Um, I'll, I'm going to work with Kim to get a recording of this and make it available on the ITSM uh, website uh, so you all can have access to that. And again, I'll, I'll send a message out to the group asking what topics we should explore next. Hey, hey Dave. Uh, th this is this is for uh, Dave. He says I go on about change management all day long. Dave Hendricks, I, I'm, let me tell you something, and this is for everybody. I, whenever I go and I talk with clients about change management, it's literally two solid days, and, and I mean like eight plus hours of nothing but change management. So please understand, you guys are doing great. I, I I love this stuff. I love these conversations. I love Mitch when we get together and chat and all that good stuff. I, I mean, you guys. Keep it up. I think you're doing a great job. And, and the big thing is, is looking for ways to mature. And that's, that's what I, you know, always continue to grow. Don't, don't fall into, and I'm, and I speak from experience on this. And this is my own, you know, working from an in the EDU world for years. It's easy to fall prey to the, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Um, there's no money at the end. There's no resources, whatever the case may be. If it's your role, man, keep growing, keep, keep pushing. Um, to make it bigger and better battery and don't allow it to uh, die on the vine. Uh, I'd like to say that, um, you know, not one size fits all. Everyone's organization is different, different sizes, different number of people uh, focused in the different areas, um, especially in the service management space. Um, but it's about, in my world, it's about trying to make the service management world as easy and as seamless as possible for our technicians so we can provide a better, better service for our customers. And that's what it comes down to. Who, who cares how we get it done? Thanks, Dave. That's awesome. Hi, right, Bob. Really appreciate your time, everyone's uh, attention for, for, jo or, um, for joining us today. Kim, I'll get together with you afterwards, and we'll get this recorded. Uh, we'll get this recording available to everyone. So, thanks, everyone. Have a great uh, day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kim. Everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thanks, Todd. Great session. Bye, -bye. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.